It is 20 years since the end of one of the world's longest, costly and most brutal civil wars. A war that went on for an incredible 27 years. The civil war in Angola began as the country's colonial masters, Portugal, pulled out in 1975, leaving rival independence movements to continue to battle it out. It quickly became a proxy conflict of the Cold War. On the one hand, the MPLA of Augustino Neto, supported by the USSR and Cuba. On the other, Jonas Sambibi's UNITA, supported by South Africa, the US and UK. The initial stages of the war saw victories for the MPLA, which took over the capital and became the de facto government. In the mid to late 80s, the war intensified. The Battle of Quito Cuanavale saw approaching 10,000 soldiers killed and ended with both sides claiming victory. After that, a ceasefire held with UN-supervised elections in 1992. The MPLA won, but Jonas Semvimi declared fraud and the fighting began again. It only ended in 2002, with the death of Sambimi, killed by government troops. The aftermath of a war, though, saw a continuing disastrous humanitarian crisis. Up to a million people had died, over four million people had been internally displaced, and much of the country's infrastructure was in ruins. 60% of people lacked access to water, and 30% of Angolan children were dying before the age of five. So 20 years on, is Angola back on its feet? Well, let's find out in this report. Clement Bonnero, Dombaxi Sebastiao, Evan Claver and Juliette Dubois revisit Angola for France 24. It's a memorial that attracts few visitors and yet it symbolises one of the greatest turning points in Angola's history. Two hands joined together and outstretched, releasing a dove taking flight. We're in Luena, the capital of Mushiko province. It was here on the 4th of April 2002 that UNITA and the MPLA signed a peace agreement, putting an end to 27 years of civil war. Dorka Kavui was a lieutenant in the armed forces for the liberation of Angola, UNITA's former armed wing. She remembers the day she heard that Jonas Savimbi had died. At that time, we had no television. People around us, from all over Mexico, were celebrating. They were shouting, so I asked them, what's going on? They said, Savimbi is dead. I knew that the war was going to end like this, because Savimbi had told us many times, we're at a turning point. Many people are going to die, from bullets or from hunger, and the others will be captured. So when I saw that the moment had come, I remembered what he said. After the war, like tens of thousands of fighters across the country, Dorka was integrated into the National Army before being demobilised and then retiring. She now lives in this modest house with one of her daughters and her four grandchildren, and she leads a peaceful life. During the war, Everything was very difficult. Children were suffering. Children were dying. I was a very active woman. I would fish in rivers to feed my children so that they wouldn't die. We had a very tough life, but now it's over. I go to the fields. I work a little. I bring food home for my children. I live a normal life because we are at peace. A law passed in 2002 guarantees social and economic rights to all former soldiers with a basic pension of 23,000 Kwanzaa or 50 euros. But two decades on, the government is yet to register each and every war veteran. In Luena, former MPLA and UNITA fighters don't see each other very often. But they've united their voices to demand the same rights. Many women in particular took an active part in the war but have struggled to get equal recognition. My husband left me because I don't work. I don't have a job. I live here with my kids. I have five children and I don't get any support from anyone. Now I work in the fields to survive. If it wasn't for the fields, I'd be looking for food in rubbish dumps. Enrico Branco fought for the MPLA, the party which has been in power since 1975. He first took part in the war against Portugal than against UNITA, but despite serving 34 years in the army, he says that authorities have simply abandoned him. 
When we were with Agostino Neto, he would tell us, when Angola is independent, you will not pay rent for houses, you will not pay for water. But to this day, nobody has ever fulfilled those promises. War veterans are treated like rubbish. We are being walked all over like doormats. They forget that everything they have today and everything that they've become is down to us. They just don't remember. Twenty years after the guns fell silent, the violence of this conflict remains deeply rooted in the memory of Angolans. Located some 500 kilometers west of Luena, Wambo was the bastion of UNITA and Jonas Savimbi. It's one of the cities that suffered the most damage during the war. Savimbi's house, the Casablanca, was destroyed by MPLA bombing after the disputed elections of 1992. Wambo was almost completely devastated. Many houses were destroyed by this one. This was the first floor. But as you can see, everything collapsed. To date, no effort has been made to rebuild Jonas Savimbi's house. The Black Rooster, as he was known, remains a controversial figure in Angola. He was only officially buried in 2019, following 17 years of negotiations between his family and the government. Now, UNITA says it wants to keep the former leader's house as a symbol of the war. But this sociologist believes the rubble in ruins are nothing but an open wound for the country. We've been at peace for 20 years. There's no reason for things to be like this. By not rebuilding this house, we're only displaying our hatred for each other. I think this is something that we have to overcome. There are other ways to keep this house as a symbol of the war. Why not just take pictures, record videos, and put everything in a museum? Around Casablanca, Wambo is a city of sharp contrasts. On the one hand, the centre has been almost entirely rebuilt, with its renovated colonial-era houses, cobbled pavements and manicured gardens. But on the outskirts of the city, many buildings still carry the scars of brutal fighting. A little further on lies Wambo's industrial park. Before the war, it was home to a dozen factories. All of them were destroyed and they never reopened. It was a fate that befell this former roofing manufacturer. After the war, the government should have launched large-scale public investments or privatization programs. Reconstruction is a complex process, everything goes hand in hand. Agriculture, farming, industrialization. When reconstruction is limited to just the rebuilding of houses, for me, that isn't reconstruction. So in a nutshell, Wambo hasn't been rebuilt yet. While Wambo struggles to shake off the shackles of the past, its residents have strived to move on from the trauma of the war. Celestino Elias is one of 80,000 Angolans who've lost a limb to a landmine. He was just two years old at the time. Now he's a world champion of amputee football and proudly keeps his medals and trophies at home. This is the trophy from the African Championship in Benguela in 2019. And this is the medal from when I was crowned best player in the world. Born into a poor family, Celestino received no medical attention during his childhood. He discovered football at the age of eight when his father signed him up for the local club despite his disability. When I was watching the other players, I wanted to play too, but they didn't want me to join in. Every time I went onto the pitch, they would step on my crutches. So I told them to stop and to let me play. Then I joined a club in Huambo. I started training there with other disabled people and I got used to it. Today, Celestino is a defender in Angola's national Paralympic team, but he still trains five times a week in Wambo. Across the country, there are now dozens of sports teams for amputees. It's crucial to promote sport among people with disabilities because sport is probably the easiest way to integrate them into society. If we succeed and if they feel like they belong, then yes, we will have made the most of the 20 years of peace that we've had in this country. The overwhelming majority of people with disabilities struggle, however, to find their place in Angola. Most live without resources and without state support. 
I would like the government to do more to help people with disabilities. I believe that as disabled people, we have a lot to give to the country. I'm a teaching assistant, I volunteer in a primary school, but I haven't been able to find a job yet. 20 years after the end of the war, Angola's wounds have not finished healing. Yet the country experienced an economic boom in the 2000s thanks to soaring prices of oil, which accounts for 70% of government revenue. The capital Luanda was even briefly dubbed the Dubai of Africa. Its gleaming skyscrapers and renovated waterfront would have us believe that this is the epicenter of a prosperous and modern Angola. But beneath the glossy image lies a harsh reality. Half of the country's population still lives on less than $2 a day. The MPLA, which won the civil war and has been in power for half a century, defends its record. A country is built over time, especially a country like ours, which does not yet have the necessary stability and where the effects of the war are still being felt. The funny thing is that those who complain the most are the ones who destroyed the country. But we, who are in charge of rebuilding and improving lives, are fully aware that we have already done a lot, even though there are still many unresolved problems. Five years ago, President João Lourenço was elected with a promise that he would stamp out corruption, pledging to turn the page on the era of his predecessor, José Eduardo dos Santos, who ruled the country from 1979 to 2017. But despite a series of high-profile trials, Angola still ranks as one of the most corrupt and unequal nations in the world. Hitler Samusuku is one of the country's best-known political activists. He uses hip-hop to demand change. His songs take aim at the Angolan president and his administration. He also calls on Angolans to take to the streets. We live in a society where political participation is low and people are very afraid to speak out because they're scared of reprisals and repression from the government. Hip-hop has given us a means of expression, a window to get our message out. Hitler is the son of Dorka, the former UNITA fighter we met in Luena. While she gave up politics traumatized by 27 years of war, he believes that peace isn't just about the downing of weapons. He wants better living conditions for all Angolans. We're in the district of Kakwako, in the northern suburbs of Luanda. It's a neighborhood with very high rates of poverty, crime, prostitution and illiteracy. Now look, this is the gate of a house. The sewage passes right in front of it, and everyone thinks it's normal. His activism has led to several arrests and has even landed him in prison first in 2015 alongside 16 other activists for starting a study group around the concept of non-violent resistance. And again in 2019 after being accused of insulting the president in a YouTube video. For me, living in peace means to live in a society with justice. I'm not saying in a just society, but in a society built on principles of justice, where the legislative, executive and judicial powers are separated. Just as my mother was committed to fighting for peace, I am committed to fighting for the MPLA to leave power. I want political change in Angola and I want my country to develop. For Hitler and his friends, 20 years after the end of the war, true peace has yet to be achieved. Clement Bonnero, Don Baxi, Sebastio, Evan Claver and Juliette Dubois revisiting Angola for France 24. Well, that's all for this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.